just want to get the question out on the table, uh, Lacey, for the, 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 the big question of, is the lag effect actually really going to matter here? I hear you saying, yes, <laughs> just wait. Well, it, it's, it's, it's monetary as well as uh, is what, what's happening with regard to fiscal policy. Uh, they both operate with lags, and they and fiscal policy doesn't operate in a way that many people generally expect them to. Um, let's deal with monetary policy. Um, the I believe that the financial cycle leads the business cycle, and um, I, I like I think there's actually three interconnecting sine waves. There's the financial cycle, the business cycle, and the price labor cycle. Um, now, these lags vary all over the place, and we calculate them, but, and I will give you some numbers, but we have to understand that the lags vary because they're different initial conditions. Uh, you don't have the same conditions domestically in a tightening cycle as, as uh, the same conditions internationally for each tightening cycle. Another critical difference is, is the demographics. Uh, sometimes demographics are very strong. Sometimes they're very weak. Uh, another element in the picture is the starting point um, of how high inflation uh, reaches before the Federal Reserve responds. In this particular case, the Federal Reserve did not respond quickly. They let the inflation run. They let it get hot and permeate into the system and, and begin to affect uh, the wage decision. Uh, so the, the, the lags are varying all over the place, and it's important to try to distinguish the, how the initial conditions uh, influence. Now, having said that, and giving, given all of these complications, I would say that from the peak of the financial cycle to the start of the GDP cycle, you're dealing with a lag of about five to nine quarters. Now, by my calculation, the financial cycle peaked in the fourth quarter of 2021. So the second quarter was the sixth quarter. The quarter that we're now in is the seventh. The fourth quarter will be the eighth. The first quarter of next year will be the ninth. In other words, we're still well within what would have been uh, the normative lags. Uh, another element here is the way in which fiscal policy operates. Now, um, people presume that, that larger deficits mean greater fiscal largesse. And there are elements of the, of the federal budget that, that potentially could help the economy. For example, between the Inflation Reduction Act and the, the CHIPS Act, uh, that adds you know, a, tri a trillion dollars uh, to federal spending over the next 10 years. And that's believed to be helpful, but um, I don't believe that it will be helpful. Uh, a couple of reasons for that. Number one, there's a great deal of academic research that shows when, when we engage in deficit financing, the economy gets a lift for about six quarters. In other words, the multiplier is positive. But then after six quarters, the multiplier begins to retreat and by the end of three years, the multiplier is negative. Yeah, in other words, essentially what happens is that the resources are transferred from the private sector to the government sector. So let, let me give you some really hard numbers here. Um, we have the deficit for the first nine months of the fiscal year from October through September, through June. And the, the deficit is $1.4 trillion which is the same as it was for the 12 months in the fiscal year 2022, okay? All right. In the first nine months of the current fiscal year, all of this $1.4 trillion deficit has been funded by the domestic private non-bank sector. The Fed was selling, the banks or the agent of the Fed was selling, and the foreign factor was nil. In addition, because the Fed and the banks were selling, the domestic non-bank sector 
actually purchased not all, uh, not only all of the new deficit, but they bought an additional trillion dollars of treasury securities, which means that the private domestic non-bank sector retroactively funded one trillion of the six trillion dollars of debt that was issued in 2020 and 2021. And when that transfer occurs, you're moving resources from the positive high multiplier private sector into the negative multiplier government sector. And, and so the increase in the budget deficit is another negative. It is not a positive. It is draining resources from the private sector and it will continue to do so under the current scheme. Okay, so let, let me just make sure I fully follow. So the, 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 the Federal Reserve has been putting its foot on the brakes, if you will, economically with its policies. I think a lot of people think, okay, yeah, but the fiscal side is, is still putting on the gas, right? We've got money coming into the system. I, I, would, I would not agree with that. I, I, I don't think you would, right? No, exactly. I don't, I would not agree. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what it, I'm trying it's to address outwardly, here. It's outwardly stimulative. It's outwardly stimulative, but, but when you allow for the fact that the resources are coming out of the private sector, it means that you are actually transferring into the negative multiplier government sector. All right, and and um, just to help people understand that, um, this comes down to productivity and how this this capital gets used. Um, you know, Lacey has said that on the government side right now, it's actually a negative multiplier, meaning that that if, if capital flows into the government sector, it's actually sort of anti-productive, if you will. Um, and so right now we're seeing this this transfer of a billion trillion four or whatever you said, you know, basically but coming from the private the for, for the for the first nine months of this fiscal year. Yeah, has gone from the private sector into the government sector, and presumably, Lacey, just because it can earn money pretty safely on that capital, right? It's but, just saying, but, hey, I can get paid, you know, five plus percent at really low rates or whatever. Um, and so it, well, that money could be spent productively in the private sector, but it's getting kind of hoovered up by these high interest rates or high yields uh, on, on safe treasuries. And, and therefore going from a public, sorry, a positive multiplier environment into a negative multiplier environment. Well said, Adam. Well said. I might say that when uh, it, it's a little bit hard to know exactly where the deficit for the current fiscal year will be, even though we have less than two months, a little, only a little bit more than two months to go, but um, the, 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 the folks at Piper Sandler who've done a great job over the years have a preliminary estimate coming from their policy group that indicates that we're gonna run a deficit of, of uh, 600 to $800 billion in the final quarter of the current fiscal year. In other words, which means that we're gonna be somewhere between 1.6 and 1.9 trillion deficit for the current fiscal year, all of which will be funded by the private non-bank sector. Uh, the, the Federal Reserve is, is basically liquidating about $96 billion a month of uh, government and uh, uh, MBS paper. And the banks are also liquidating. And so by definition, it means that this, your domestic private non-bank sector has, has got to give up the resources to fund the government sector. Okay, all right. So basically what I hear you saying is, is we, we, really, we really have a, a, a Federal Reserve that's trying to cool the economy and the deficit spending that's going on that, that many people have thought, oh, well, that's kind of counteracting that. You're saying, no, it's actually not. It's, it's in many ways probably making it worse. 